Um, I'm from Sandpoint in the Shumigan Islands, and um, this is the, the view, or close to the view that I had growing up, and I grew up next to the water, and, and uh, geography is a really important um, player in how we grow up in the world that we see, and I really uh, credit uh, growing up in Sandpoint and the experiences that I had as a child walking those beaches um, that kind of influenced my worldview today. So thanks to the community at Sandpoint. Um, I grew up um, with a big interest in food, and uh, uh, not necessarily traditional foods, actually. Salmon was one of my least favorite foods uh, growing up, and my mom tells me stories of having to force me to eat salmon, and, and I love salmon now, um, but it was something that was given to me, and it's one of those things that I'll talk a little bit later as far as children and, and getting their taste buds set for traditional foods. Um, now I love dried salmon and, and all of the different forms and fashions. Um, my grandparents, Emil and Marina Anderson, Emil from Sanak Island and uh, Marina from Alaska, also really influenced my understanding of Alaska and food. And um, grandmother had a lot to say, and um, I credit my grandmother as well in, in the understanding of food. And uh, she made the most amazing octopus burgers. Um, that uh, I can't even uh, rival today as far as the, the foods that she, she cooked for us in her kitchen. Um, my grandfather, Emil, I, I had the honor of um, fishing with him for a couple of years with my uncles, and I learned a lot how to read the weather and how to know where um, the fish were, how to read the tide streaks, and um, really influenced uh, my food culture as well. And one of his recipes is um, codfish. Um, belly, and you put in cod livers um, into the codfish belly, and then you boil that. Um, it's an amazing dish. Uh, thanks to Grandma for that dish. Um, another influenced, uh, another person influenced me really greatly in that um, is Nora Newman. And uh, Nora Newman um, lived right down the road from us, and um, over the years she's played a really important role in just kind of reminding me about food and the importance of our culture and, and how we grew up. And um, she introduced me to kelp, um, ribbon kelp, and, and how to eat it, and the importance of, of kelp and seaweeds. And when we look at um, traditional foods, there's so much and such a rich variety of foods around us. And we call it the store outside your door. There's this virtual paradise of food around us. And, and one of Nora's comments, and which is a traditional comment of our people who live near the ocean, and that is, when the tide is low, the table is set. And uh, a really important concept when you start thinking about food and, and what's around you. And um, there's uh, tons of food on the beaches. Another favorite food of mine, um, the chitin or the padarki, um, is a really wonderful, tasty treat on the beach. Um, the importance of keeping our beaches safe and some of the environmental considerations are really important as well so that these foods can be sustainable foods for all of our generations. And this concept, this indigenous concept of seven generations, and um, um, that, com th that uh, philosophy is really flourishing now in the environmental movement of helping us preserve the environment for future generations so they can enjoy um, this um, tide, this low table is set concept. I thank my family for, for inspiring me with uh, traditional foods and, and getting out there and gathering them ourselves. Um, my father and I, um, subsistence salmon fishing, and uh, my mother as well, who I'm um, honored to have in the audience today, um, really influenced my understanding and also the, the priority that we place on traditional foods and taking time to go and gather and fill the freezer full of these nutrient-dense foods, amazing foods. And um, one of the workshops that we did at my workplace at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, um, we were talking about traditional foods and the fact that salmon has become a luxury item. And when we look at our traditional foods, um, they're amazing, they're a bounty, and for us to really value them, um, they are a luxury, and uh, they're something we want to preserve and protect, and, and we want to get out there and we want to gather those traditional foods as much as possible and interact with our environment. As a naturopathic doctor, one of the fundamental principles of naturopathic medicine is vis medicatrix naturae, and that means the healing power of nature, the body's inherent ability to heal itself when given the proper nutrients and love and, and taking care of this temple of ours. And Hippocrates, considered the father of medicine, said, let foods 
be your medicine. Let your medicine be your food. And, and this is a very important principle that you know we can be vital for our entire life, from our younger, more vital years, till we pass on and our spirit leaves our body. It's very um, closely aligned to traditional values of Alaska Native people, and that when we look at food and food as medicine, it's, it's throughout our indigenous cultures, our elders say, know your traditional foods, protect your environment, we're stewards of our environment. It's a very deep traditional knowledge, and I had um, um, the honor to live in Hawaii for a couple of years, and, and I um, joined a Hawaiian chorus and learned some Hawaiian, and, and one of the words in Hawaiian that was really a poignant is aina, and that means um, land, but it's not just land, it's this whole understanding that the land is a spiritual being and that would take care of that land. And there's this term in Hawaiian, um, kama aina, which means it's the people of the land, and we have a responsibility to care for that land and, and, uh, and celebrate that. The land takes care of us and we take care of the land. That's very much a part of our traditional cultures. And um, one of my um, mentors and friends and co-workers now at the consortium is Dr. Rita Blumenstein. And, and Dr. Rita um, shares a lot about traditional culture and food and celebrating food and um, her house and hanging out with her. There's a virtual paradise of food all around you all the time. And, and being an elder now, um, in the last of culture, we take care of our elders and her freezers are always full of this amazing food. And um, So helping her prepare that food is, is a really important part of hanging out with Rita and, and then listening to the stories that she has to share. When I came back after finishing medical school, um, I traveled in the Eastern Aleutian region working for Eastern Aleutian tribes. And one of the things that I really appreciated about was, you know, our culture is so rich and vibrant. And, and at the same time, I, I, I really felt that, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Who's keeping our culture? Who's preserving their knowledge and helping our, our, the, the words of our elders be perpetuated? Who's writing this down? Who's keeping that knowledge? Um, and the appreciation as I've traveled the illusions, um, I now work with the consortium, I've been 10 years in the tribal health system, um, you know, who's helping us understand um, this knowledge, this incredible paradise of food around us that can sustain us and, and keep our children and our, our, uh, our people healthy and safe? There's a lot connected to our traditional foods when we look at our traditional foods. Uh, vitamin D has become really um, prominent in the literature and understanding in Alaska that most of us don't get enough vitamin D. And when we look at traditional foods, um, Rob spoke earlier about um, salmon head soup, and that soup is amazing. Um, it's a traditional food, and you know, what do we give our elders? Our elders love fish head soup. Why do they love fish head soup? Because fish head soup preserves and protects their bones, has vitamin D in it, it's, it's super nutrient dense. And so um, when we look at our tradition of foods, they sustain us and they help address some of these issues that as vitamin D is. Um, people who eat a traditional diet that is rich in vitamin D, such as um, um, the, the fish oils, seal oils, fish head soup, those people don't have vitamin D deficiency. I love all of the foods that are around us. Fireweed is an amazing tea. It's, uh, you can put it in salads. Um, you can eat it shoots soon. We'll see these beautiful um, fireweed shoots come up and we can harvest them and eat them. And um, they're amazing in a salad, full of vitamin A, rich in nutrients and, and help our bodies heal. Um, the, the term store outside your door, when we think about it, it's kind of like this, you remember those, um, two-dimensional um, posters that were really popular in the 90s when you had to look at them for a period of time and all of a sudden the picture behind would come out. Um, I see the store outside your door kind of that way, whereas sometimes we just see it's beautiful, amazing um, scenery. Um, it's beautiful, but we don't necessarily always see what's behind that beauty. When we look at this, it's, it's a bunch of sticks maybe or you know some, some wildlife. But when we look at um, the... Um, the buds that come up that can be part of a salad. This is Apple Paddock Horda or Devil's Club. Amazing um, mm. in a salad, and you can steam these as well. Super nutrient dense. And, and another principle I like to always share when I'm sharing about food and, and talking about some of our traditional foods is within a traditional context, we uh, honor the land, right? And we take care of it. And so we leave something for somebody else to come and get. We never ever take too much from one area. We always respect 
And there was an article recently um, in Science Daily around um, the Anungan Aleut people on Sinak Island and the fact that they had this healthy ecosystem that they never ever over harvested any one area. They always went around and take, took care of it and therefore had a sustainable um, system. Um, we need to remember that when we look at harvesting and always leaving something for somebody else and Hatcher's Pass, which is close to Anchorage here, um, we need to, when we pick our berries, we need to respect everyone else that's going to come after us and not overpick any one area. So I always like to highlight that as we look at Devil's Club shoots. Make sure you save some for somebody else when you're out there harvesting. In the spring, I love the spring foods. Uh, this is Patrishki or beach lovage, really rich. You can make a pesto out of it. You can do all kinds of things. Cook it with your fish is the traditional way. Um, horsetail, rich in, in nutrients and minerals. Nettles. Um, goose tongue, amazing. I, I learned a lot about this this last year in Southeast Alaska. This is a big traditional food of our Klinkiet, Haida, and Shinshen people. And uh, as I traveled, the traditional foods, native people are all about food. And any native gathering is not a gathering unless you have traditional foods there. And so, you know, the pick or the salmon berry of the north is an amazing berry. And um, it does look like salmon eggs. And they say, this is the salmon berry. And from our region, our salmon berry is a little bit different. Um, it you know, grows differently. It's a different um, berry, actually. But the salmon berry is an amazing um, plant, rich in vitamin C and nutrients. This is my official favorite um, berry. This is the moss berry, or the, the blackberry. We use uh, the tundra berry. And we've done some research on this berry with um, colleagues at North Carolina State University um, and Rutgers University. And our berries are some of the richest in nutrients as far as antioxidants are concerned. And there's this theory, Dr. Marianne Lila, with North Carolina State University, who's devoted her life to berry research. She says, the harsher the environment, the stronger the antioxidants in berries. And so when we look at our berries of the north, they're super off the charts. They're literally super berries. And uh, rich in nutrients and antioxidants to help protect us from cancer and a host of chronic disease. Dr. Rita likes to talk about plants and the Aleutians and the north, you know, the more extreme weather conditions, they grow smaller. And so this is Coltsfoot, and, and the, the Aleutian variety is very small um, leaves. And the South Central variety is much larger. And what I did is I transplanted it from the Aleutians, and um, all of a sudden, this incredible environment, and all this extra warmth, and it's not so um, rigorous as far as the wind, the leaves grew huge, and so it's amazing to see how plants adapt. Um, that's still a very powerful plant, and in barrel, the same plant, very small leaves. Um, Rhodiola rosea has gotten a lot of press recently, Russian rose root, and it's an adaptogen similar to ginseng. And what I love about it, I've been studying it for years before I ever knew about Russian rose root. Um, it's just a beautiful, it collects water. And when you look at this plant as you hike up at the mountain in the Aleutians, this is an amazing plant. It's always um, full of water. And I call these plants that collect water, I call them God's diamonds. They're like amazing when you look at the, the varieties. And they're just a beautiful plant. I really love taking pictures of plants. Um, the beautiful plants that have dual purposes. Geranium is relaxing and calming. And it's like an, um, you can make it into a tea. And the whole plant is edible. And the leaves can also be in a salad. And I love the smell of the geranium, the wild geranium. As a child, I, I feel really blessed to have grown up with traditional foods and traditional food knowledge. And as kids, we'd be out picking um, the cow parsnip, um, the poochkies, and we would be eating them with the wild celery. We would be um, working with this plant, the chocolate lily, which is kind of a stinky plant. But at the base of it is, a, is a, like a rice that you can cook. It's a tuber. Um, you gotta be careful with these plants because sometimes they can be over harvested. And so the yeah, ideal is to grow your own because you can, you can actually buy these at some of our um, 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 gardening places in Alaska. Um, some are really powerful plants and herbs and we need to respect. And um, This is uh, the Valeriana um, unalaskansis, or the Aleutian variety. And um, A good friend of mine and I picked this root and then we made tea out of it, but we took too much and she ended up with this incredible migraine. Um, it was like this amazing experience. I was like, we gotta be careful with that. And sure enough, it's a really powerful plant. You have to respect it, but valerian is great as a calming plant and it's good for sleep. There's many powerful sentinels of the forest, like the, the Devil's Club, which have been used for 
um, generations and thousands of years by indigenous people. And when we respect those plants, they take care of us. And elders say that the plants that are around us are there to help us heal. And so when you look at plants that grow in an environment, if there's lots of those plants, they're telling you something. The plants actually are part of this living world. So I'm going to step it up because I'm running out of time. Um, foods um, that are rich in nutrients, these animals eat, and those animals have that same food in them. And so when we look at our wild game, are rich in food and rich in these healthy oils, and, and they help sustain us. Um, we respect them and, and take care of them. And when we look at what's in um, uh, seal, for example, the iron that's in seal it takes you two servings of caribou. How many hamburgers does it take you to get that much iron? How many hot dogs do you think? <laughs> A whole lot of hot dogs. Wow. So these foods are so incredibly rich for you. And um, many of us have uh, been faced with this challenge when we look at um, fast food. And we need to start changing the way that we live. Um, our children are faced with an obesity epidemic. And it's super expensive. And it's also um, debilitating to our kids. And they need to grow up with a taste for traditional foods. Many of us are facing a premature death due to chronic disease, due to not eating good and not following a traditional way of life. Um, gas is expensive in the village, and so how do we maintain traditional food um, consumption? You have to be creative, because in the villages, it can get up to 10 or $12 a gallon, so getting out and getting those traditional foods can be very difficult. But there are, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of research saying that traditional foods help you, even when you have cancer, when you have other kinds of chronic disease, traditional foods can help you feel better. They sustain you. They're at the, the root of Maslow's hierarchy. They're one of your basic needs. And I've been blessed to work with wonderful folks like Lorraine Lloyd and my current work um, mates, um, Margaret David, Nita um, dewitt Schiefman, and Desiree Simeon and I, um, we're working on the Store Outside project that brings us all over the state and uh, really inspires us with listening to this traditional knowledge and the foods that sustain us. And also, they gave us some exercise in going to get them, too. So my favorite um, flowered smell is the bog lily. It's an amazing flower. Um, so in finishing, I'm just going to page through a couple of wonderful photos, God's diamonds, and the quotes by Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future, will give no medicine, but will interest his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Thank you very much.